Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be discussing the first movement of Bach's Sonata No. 1 in G minor, the Adagio. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some general issues that pertain to all of the movements of all of the Bach sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So one of the things that's really interesting about the first movement of both of Bach's first two sonatas, the G minor adagio and the A minor grave, is that some of the notes aren't really notes. What the heck do I mean by that? Well, basically, some of the notes are melody and others are decoration. Basically, if another composer had written this movement, they might have actually left it for the performer to add their own ornaments. That was by far the, the more normal way to do things in the Baroque period. So the first phrase might have sounded something like this. Now you would never just play it that way bare off the page. You would add your own decorations, um, kind of like an R&B singer adds melismas to a melody line or a jazz saxophonist adds a bunch of extra notes. And so perhaps Bach wrote out every single ornament, maybe because he wanted to make sure that you didn't overdo it. You know, if you don't put any ornaments on there, it's like not adding the accessories to your outfit. But of course, you don't want to wear 16 necklaces and a ring on every finger. And maybe some virtuosos were getting too virtuosic by 1720. <laughs> Every one of those things I just did is appropriate to the Baroque era, but doing them all at once is just a little bit too much. Like, where did Bach go under all of that gobbledygook? So it's great that he left us this, you know, already done movement for us with ornaments of perfect taste. But as we're playing it, we have to remember which are the main notes and which are the decorations. Because if we played, for example, the first scale passage as if it's the melody, then that's just kind of the wrong feel. We're giving it too much meaning that it really doesn't have. Right? Because that's not the tune. It's just basically this big chord going to the next chord, and that scale is a beautiful cascade connecting them. Another connector. And then actually, speaking of that first phrase, which note should we hold on that last chord that I just did? The chord that's the same as the first um, chord of the um, very opening of the movement. Well, a lot of people, because it's kind of the middle voice that's doing the decorating, will then polyphonically roll onto the middle voice. In other words, then we have that C that kind of carries on. But if you think about the melody itself, and then you have the F sharp going to the G and kind of bookending the phrase. In fact, that's the more important voice um, to be bringing out in the end. This G. We travel through all this stuff. Then back to the G, and also keeping this F in mind, which is written as a full quarter, even though we can't actually hold it for a quarter note's worth of time. It has to remain in our ear that it's still existing and finally turns into a G. So I would definitely argue in favor of come rolling off if you roll onto anything to um, sort of err in favor of the top voice. Of course, you could always hold both notes on that last chord. Lots of different options. Um, but anyway, that's something to, something to consider. So I played this movement for probably, I don't know, eight, ten years before one day it was like, duh, and I suddenly saw the structure. I couldn't, once I saw it, I couldn't believe that it took me that long. But it is actually pretty obscured by all of these ornaments. 
Basically, the secret of this movement is that the first eight bars and the last eight bars, last eight meaning not including the last measure, um, but the last eight bars of, of stuff, um, those are the exact same music. The first eight start in G minor and end up on D minor, and then you've got your five bar um, middle section, and then you have the exact same music repeated starting on C minor and ending up on G minor. So the key is a fifth different, but the music is exactly the same except ornamented quite differently. It's really fun to take one measure, like measure one, and compare it against measure 14, then take measure two and compare it against measure 15, and kind of go back and forth like that so that you can really understand um, what's consistent about the music and it helps you figure out which of these notes are the ornament notes. What's interesting is when Bach does things that are almost the same, there's still just little bits of differences. So if we start um, you know, after the beginning of measure six, here we have a straight scale. And then this bit with two, two note slurs. Now we have almost the same music um, back in measure 19 later on, but with a little extra thingy at the end. Right? So it's on. This time he adds. And then here are the exact same notes, but a three note slur. And here a dotted rhythm. Instead of. So he always just liked to mix it up a little, never the same way twice. So um, when you think about the fact that it's structured A, B, A, the return to the second A is very critical to kind of be a tour guide for your listener through the movement and set it up so that it's really obvious like we've started again. Interestingly, when Bach begins the first A section, of course, it's with a big full four note chord. <laughs> When he establishes the C minor start at measure 14, it's a single note. So there's certainly a valid argument to be made that maybe you should kind of sneak in there. Maybe it is not necessarily interpreted the same just because it's the same music. And that variety is also always a, a good thing to consider. Um, these days, lately, I personally like to kind of start just as bold um, after all of these ornaments leading up to it. Just kind of. Like here we are again, really setting it. But of course, you know, no right or wrong, that's just one, one option. There's always the question of that mysterious E natural in the third beat of measure three. Should we play, you know, the exact notes of Bach's manuscript or did he make a mistake? And a mistake right at the beginning of the entire cycle, one of the few. Well, I honestly do think that it was a mistake and maybe one of those things where people, you know, in 1720 had such a good sense of harmony. There was no such thing as a performer who wasn't also a composer. Everybody played keyboard. They really knew their figured bass. So probably Bach and anyone playing this piece would have all just kind of known that that needed to be an E flat and he must have just not written it because he accidentally missed it but didn't realize he missed it because it was so obvious. And when we look at the corresponding beat, third beat of measure 16, where there's an A flat, then it's like really obvious that that was the harmonic progression. Right, the coverage. Same thing here. And it just sounds wrong to. Especially when you then have this E flat though. That's really what it's supposed to be, and the variety that Bach is creating between the two A sections. He doesn't do anything else harmonically different, so why would he do it in that one note that sounds wrong? So I really strongly urge you to put an E flat on the third beat of measure three. When you're first learning this movement, it's kind of this big mathematical puzzle to just figure out what all of the rhythms are. I would really urge you to break down each measure into its four beats because after all, the movement is written in 4-4, four, four, not 8-8. Eight, eight. And the worst thing is when you hear somebody performing it and it's very clear that they're still counting in 8. Of course, you have to count in 8 for a while till you get used to the way that the movement works. But then after that, definitely try to think of the big beat 
of course, when you're learning it, um, sometimes you even have to think in terms of sixteenths. In other words, dividing every quarter of the measure, um, one fourth of the measure that's a quarter note worth, into four sections itself. So like measure 10, one, two, three, four, for just the first quarter note, and then the next one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and those eighths seem very long in comparison after the sixty-fourths. And that actually brings an, up an interesting issue. So often people will kind of squish some of the slower notes and then expand some of the faster notes. But I think Bach wrote all of these specific note values for a reason. And it's always good before adding rubato to see if you can make a compelling case for the print. So this measure that I just played. <laughs> have that, oh, that cascade down and then that little clump of notes at the end. It kind of gives you some impetus leading into beat three that you wouldn't have if you didn't have those 64ths or if you took those 64ths and spread them. Then you wouldn't have that kind of propelling you forward feeling. So it's really good, even after you've been playing this movement for months or even years, to go back to the drawing board and play Bach's rhythms metronomically. Now, I would never recommend actually interpreting them metronomically because that would be horrible. But a rubato is only meaningful if it's varying from something. And so if you've lost sight of where you started from, then the rubato could become the rhythm and sound like the wrong rhythm. So you want to know what the rhythm is, and then if you want to do a little bit of pushing and pulling, ebbing and flowing, and breathing, then that makes more sense. Speaking of breathing, it's really important to take time between some of the phrases. After all, inhumanly long musical lines like we have in the Romantic era in the 19th century didn't yet exist, and people tended to think of phrase length in the Baroque period as what would be natural to the human voice where you would have to stop and take a breath. So in the middle of measure two, for example, is a great place. <laughs> before going on and something like um, oh maybe the towards the end of measure five take time so when I talk about making sure that you are you know, sort of go back to the metronome when making these decisions that's really for within the beats themselves but between phrases you can take all the time in the world. Just want to point out a couple of other examples of those 64th notes that people rarely play. Oh, here's even a couple of 128th notes. This is in measure three. You hear how exciting that is when it goes brrrr. If you spread that, you lose that excitement. Especially with that trill, people are tempted to really indulge in it, but it's just a little momentary flick, really. And of course, that E flat is leading to the D, and you don't want to lose sight of that. Another one would be the end of seven. Again, propelling you forward. So uh, I guess the only other thing to really mention about rhythm is the fact that sometimes when you're playing multiple voices, there are a lot of written notes that you literally can't hold for their printed length. Um, one example is um, the end of measure nine. So the last beat, we have a eighth note in the top voice, but then because you have two thirty seconds of the same pitch in the lower voice, you can't slur it in to hold that eighth note for an eighth note's worth of time. And you're not going to re-articulate it to have it exist for an eighth note, because then you're going with the upper voice, which just doesn't sound good. So you have to only play the eighth note for 30 seconds worth of time. But of course, what Bach put on the page is what he wants you to think of, what the notes need to exist in your imagination as being. 
And you actually can play it differently, not for the amount of time, but for the way that you cause it to be heard. So here's how it might sound if it were written as a 32nd. See, there it sounded like a true 32nd, but now I'm going to play it as if it's an eighth. See how it makes you think that it's longer than it actually is? Kind of magic. So always keep those in mind, the printed lengths, even if they're not, you know, literally what ends up happening. And that brings us to our big bugaboo, the third beat of measure one, and should we or should we not slur? Well, the argument for slurring, of course, is because then the upper voice quarter note can be heard for a quarter note's worth of time. Of course, the lower note, the lower note is only heard for like a sixteenth before you roll right off of it. You're not going, <laughs> right? Never do that. Um, but that's what tons of people do. However, it makes you do, first of all, a slur in the middle voice that Bach never wrote, which isn't the end of the world. It's a tasteful slur. Unfortunately, the fingering necessary to execute it is not tasteful in the least. This 3-3 three, three doesn't sound Baroque at all, unless you're not planning to play it Baroqueishly. So, so I would it's, urge you to consider, at least, um, the possibility of making that quarter note feel like a quarter, but then climbing off of it to be able to do an up bow, which then, of course, has to hook into the next slur. So you can get to a down bow here. So there's issues either way you choose, but it's something to, to think about. Don't just automatically make that slur because everybody makes the slur. Kind of think about what the options are. Well, that brings us to the issue of bowing. Now, people who think you should follow Bach's manuscript exactly and do you know, all of the Boeings and nothing but the Boeings, you know, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth when it comes to Bach's Boeings. Well, that's a very admirable jumping off point. However, some of his slurs, it's like, well, it's sort of in between the notes. Did he mean it to belong to the note to the left or the note to the right? It's your opinion which one it might be. And then there are clearly some places where it's like, I'm really not sure what he meant. Measure 17 is a great example of that because as opposed to other times when Bach's slur wasn't really just a straight curve. Sometimes he does these little wiggles in the middle. Some of it just has to do with fitting it in between, you know, the other notes in the scrunchy manuscript. Other times it might actually be implying something musically. Hard to tell. But in measure 17, he clearly has one slur ending on a certain note, but then the next slur beginning on that same note, which literally can't exist. So what the heck was going on there? <laughs> That slur goes all the way to the A, but then the next slur is there, and it's not one slur. So most people, of course, do this. But anyway, those are things that are important for you to think through for yourself and make your own decisions, because maybe you will be that one rebellious person that goes. I've never heard anybody do it, but it would be equally justifiable as doing this. Because either way, you're altering a slur, I suppose. Or maybe do them all in one slur, but that just wouldn't quite work out downs and ups. And yeah, there's always issues. Um, one of the big issues for me is what the heck to do with the end of measure 13. That's a really fun spot because it's got a little bit of funky syncopation going on that you can really have fun with. The only way to really bring out the syncopation is to make sure your trill doesn't get too trilly because if you do that, then it becomes a totally different rhythm. So a trill just meant to do something. It doesn't tell you how much you're supposed to do. So even just one flick is acceptable because it means you did a kind of a thing on that note. So if you do it without the trill and feel the rhythm and then only add as much trill as still works without altering the rhythm. So don't alter the rhythm for the sake of the trill. Fit the trill in for the sake of the rhythm. So. And if you can get two little wiggles in there, more power to you. But it's almost impossible, and really, don't stress about it. Just a little turn is perfectly acceptable for a trill on a 30-second note. Okay, so what bowing do we do? We're down bow here. Then we have this slur. Then if we keep going, as written in the manuscript, 
we're down bow, and then we're supposed to be down bow here, I would assume. You want to start the next section down bow, the return to the A, the first note of the third section. So it just doesn't work. So there's a number of different options, and I've gone through most of them over the years. Um, you can hook in this note, or you could do this down bow, and then split this which isn't quite as pleasing in terms of, but you could still make it work in terms of making it sound like a slur. Always, if you split a slur, slur, make sure it doesn't suddenly sound like it's supposed to be two slurs. Make it sound to the ear like it's so one long slur. Good example of that is from measure five. You kind of have to split that slur. I mean, I guess you could do this, but it's so much more comfortable. But make sure if you do split that slur that you don't make it sound like a new bow because it's really just a fake continuation of the same bow. So anyway, back to our spot at the end of 13. We could hook those. Though that doesn't feel quite as baroque, you could get away with it. Or maybe almost like a little um, lift. So a kind of note shapes that not a romantic era hook. Um, what I've been doing lately, which is still not ideal, but fading that down bow, which allows me to come in with a new down bow, but it depends on whether that's your interpretation. If you want to kind of phrase but lead, either way, I would strongly urge you to take a breath, but Doing legato into that note just feels a little unbaroque, um, but of course, you know, some people could really pull it off and make it sound beautiful. So just figure out what option you want to do now, and then maybe next year you'll change your mind. The trills with the is at the end of measures 12 and 21 are another spot where you kind of have to figure out what are you going to do about the bowing, because the one in 12. <laughs> I like slurring that because it's a written out anticipation of the trill. So that E flat really isn't a separate note. It's not that you're having an E flat and then you're trilling a D with a new appoggiatura. The E is the appoggiatura. He just wrote it out for you because he gave you all your ornaments. Well, then you've got this E to get all the way down to here, or you could lift, which would be really tasteful. A lot of people split it, but I would kind of not really like that solution because you could fake it. But it ends up sounding too much like two notes, whereas really it's one note. It's like the whole quarter is a trill on the D and it's just a written out appoggiatura. So you wouldn't split in the middle of a note. Um, so that's a tricky one. And then the other one at the end is a little less, um, you know, less of being without a solution. It's not devoid of a solution. You could take another down bow here, second beat of 21, which feels great for the start of the second beat. Then of course you've got to catch that four note chord on an up bow. And by the way, here, remember the polyphony seems like it wants to go from the middle voice, but here he actually goes from the upper voice which is pretty interesting. And then a really scrunch ornament. And then if I took my down bow on the second beat of 21, then I'm up bow here on the appositor, which allows me to hook in the little up bow without a big lift, which is great. On the other hand, if it matters more to me to have this be a chord on a down bow, then I would be up over here. And oh darn. And again, I wouldn't take an up over here because that just doesn't sound right. So for me right now, as far as I've been able to think through the options, the best solution is to take that down bow on the second beat and then just deal with the up bow chord on the four notes right after it, which is not so bad with a Baroque bow anyway. One of the biggest issues with bowing in this movement is crossing over strings. Um, different than string crossing. A string crossing could be to a consecutive string. 
And of course with those, we all know that we're supposed to blend them to kind of prepare to go from the A string to the D string by getting a little closer and then seamlessly moving over, whether it's within a slur or separate bows. But you actually have to use kind of the opposite technical approach when you're going to a non-consecutive string, in other words, between G and A, between D and E, or between G and E, crossing over one or even two strings. There are 26 spots in this movement that have multiple string string crossings. A few of them could be alleviated if you did more non-baroque fingerings going into second position or things like that to avoid a big hop, but most of them you're just stuck for it. And so um, practicing them, it's actually the opposite because if you're leaning from the A string towards the G string and you're going towards it, you're gonna bump the D string. So you actually have to stay centered on the A string and then circle right over and around to get to the G string. So it's really important to listen between the notes in this movement, kind of like when you're cleaning your bathroom tiles. You don't just clean the tiles, you also clean the grout between the tiles. So really listen for that grout and make sure it doesn't have any mold in it. Because, okay, so here's the first one in measure four, um, beat four. You're on the E string, then you have to go to the a chord in the GD. Um, next one would be measure six. There's two of them back and forth. E string, D string, E string. I think the highest concentration of them is between measures 11 and 12. D, E, D, E. That's pretty dastardly. Um, so there's lots of them throughout the movement and isolating them, practicing them extra separately, getting used to your physical motions to avoid them, even marking them into your part. I put red slashes, you know, took a red pen and put slashes between the notes every time one of those occurred so that I wouldn't miss any and so I could listen for them specifically when I record myself and listen back and I'm thinking of interpretation and maybe not paying as much attention to see which of them I've drilled sufficiently and which of them are still bumping strings in between. Also make sure when you're listening to your three and four note chords that you listen specifically to the lowest voice, specifically to the upper voice, just making sure that you don't accidentally lose any notes when, you know, making sure that when you do do all those string crosses to different strings, like, oh, let's say um, measure 16, where you're on the E string coming right back, it would be easy enough to fluff those lower notes. But making sure you really hear the G, the low, and then the A flat on the G string and that you train your ear to, to listen for those because you, if you're not listening to see if you notice them, you might not notice that you didn't hear them, if you know what I mean. Well, those are some of my thoughts about the G minor adagio. Thanks for watching. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine and this is RBP on JSB.